Okay, welcome to the fourth night of our Themes of the Kingdom. I'm going to start with just a bit of story or experience. Um, I grew up not far from here uh, in a, a not perfect home. Uh, probably, maybe, maybe not perfect like yours, I'm not sure, but uh, my parents were were uh, not perfect. <laughs> uh, we had our struggles, but grew up on a farm, learned how to work, learned a lot of things. My dad taught me a lot. I was just thinking this week about how much my dad gave me, how much he taught me. Uh, just incredible gifts that, that God gave me through that. But then, I think it was around... Uh, I, I was 16 or 18 years old when we started going into Lancaster City uh, and meeting people there. We were, uh, we got connected to uh, sort of a halfway house for, for teenagers or for children up, up, to, up into teenagers, teenage years. And they would, they would be put in this place when they were between foster care and another foster home or they were coming from prison and getting ready to go to another place and they were put in the shelter for in the Fulton shelter for sometimes a month sometimes a week sometimes 6 months and we would go in once a week and we would we would sing and we would uh, study the bible and and things like that but through that we we got further involved in uh, people's lives there That's a big water bottle there. Uh, I shouldn't miss that. <laughs> Thank you, Gracie. Did you get some amina? <laughs> okay. So anyway, we, uh, we, we started getting involved with children then, and eventually through the children made our way into people's homes and, and uh, <clears throat> got to know people and spent a lot of time talking to people in their homes, praying with people, hearing their stories. And... I just remember uh, that experience of coming from the farm in Whitehorse where I grew up and you know I didn't know anyone I mean none of my friends uh, had a broken home we were uh, I'm sure not all of them were perfect and there was none of them were perfect um, there was challenges and there's challenges in everyone's home but but I just remember hearing the stories of just tragedy and brokenness, like, I, could, I couldn't fathom. I, I remember specifically one woman that uh, her children would come to, to children's, to kids club, and then to, they were involved with the, with the choir at one point. She had five sons, and they all had a different father. And, I mean, I came from this protected, you know, environment, uh, Amish, Mennonite, Beachy, whatever we call ourselves. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, I'm up against a world that's just in my backyard that is completely different than what I've ever seen before. I couldn't believe I didn't even know that there was a world out there like that. I, I just, I, I wasn't aware that the world is, is as broken as it, as it is. I say that to highlight uh, what I think Jesus came to do. He came to save. He came to restore. He came to make whole. So we started this week talking about two gospel paradigms. One which I call the gospel of salvation. Uh, and by the way, that's prob probably not the best way to say it. I, there, I'm, you could probably come up with better ways to categorize these two. But that's how I've chosen to do it. So the one I call the gospel of salvation, and it's represented by a quote from Luther, Martin Luther, when he said, if men only believe in Christ, they can commit adultery and murder a thousand times a day without periling their salvation. Now there's a theology of salvation behind that, that statement uh, that is alive today. I think it's very alive today. Um, what is salvation? And that's one of the questions I'd like to look at tonight. And I, the, the other side, I um, had a quote by Menno Simons, 
uh, representing what I call the gospel of the kingdom. And uh, represented by this quote where Mano Simons, he said, true ev evangelical faith cannot lie dormant. It clothes the naked, it feeds the hungry, it comforts the sorrowful, it, it shelters the destitute, it serves those that harm, it binds up that which is wounded, it has become all things to all creatures. Monday night we talked about Jesus' call to repentance. And uh, what does repentance mean? What does it mean to repent? What did we say? Somebody? To change your mind, to change your thinking, uh, to think differently, to think afterwards, to reconsider for the better. And it also has to do with changing direction somewhat. But I think at the basic level, it's basically a change of thinking. And then Jesus said why we should change our thinking. And the reason is that not so that we don't go to hell, <laughs> um, not so that we can avoid burning in the flames, uh, but because he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, if something's at hand, it's something we can, I think it's something we can get our whole, I think Jesus, it's here, it's present. In one place he said, if I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. And there's some other scriptures we talked about. So the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it is among you. And because of that, because the kingdom uh, values, the kingdom ways are so uh, upside down, or actually they're probably right side up. It's the rest that's upside down. But the kingdom values seem so, they're, they're so different. They're so strange to the world. They're, they make peculiar kind of people, funny people, funny looking people uh, to the world. But it's because they're shaped by a different thinking, a different way, a different pattern. I think it's exciting to be, it, that's just, sometimes we're embarrassed about who we are. We're kind of strange, we look different, you know, and we want to fit in maybe the younger generation more than the older. But uh, I, I just think it's such a privilege to be a part of a people that think differently, that actually embody uh, another way that is shaped by different values. So the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because it's at hand, because it's such a different paradigm, a different way of thinking, we have to change our thinking. That's just an interesting idea. Because when we think about getting someone saved, uh, we think about getting them to pray a prayer or accept Jesus into their heart. And that's actually not even a scriptural term, to accept Jesus into your heart. Uh, but we, we, we don't think in terms of getting them to change their thinking. And I, I wanna, I'm hoping to, tomorrow night to talk some about how these ideas uh, could impact the way we think about mission and uh, sharing the gospel and bringing the good news to others. It's a change of thinking, how, do, how does that happen? Of course, it's the Spirit of God, but we'll talk, I hope we can talk about that tomorrow night. Um, <clears throat> Tuesday we talked about, last night we talked about the king. There is a king, Jesus is the king, and he doesn't get elected. Uh, he won't run for office again. Uh, he is the king. And we have the opportunity to allow him to reign in our lives in every time, in every place, in every inch of ground that we give to him uh, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our businesses, in our churches, in our relationships, every inch of space that we give him uh, to reign. That's where the kingdom of heaven has come and it is coming. Slowly it grows and it grows and it grows. I think the, the parable where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It starts really small, but it grows and it grows and it grows. And I think that's a, a great a picture of how that as, as we allow God's life to be planted in us, it slowly grows and it grows and it grows and we become more and more uh, the people that God wants us to be. So the king reigns uh, as we allow him to. Um, he came to bring wholeness, shalom. He's the prince of shalom. He's the prince of peace. And he's going to reign forever and ever and ever. The Lord's Prayer, I think, is one of my favorite passages. Uh, it's just Jesus saying, this is how you should pray. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And I, I, I mention this again so often. We're thinking about getting to heaven. And, and here he's saying we should pray that heaven will be getting into us coming to us. I ended with two stories, one of Jacinta and how that through her experience 
of seeing uh, the kingdom. Her life is deeply impacted. And now, now, doesn't, now she doesn't only have a faith that uh, is in her heart. She has a faith that is, has really been transformational. And if you look at where she came from and where she is today, it's amazing. It's incredible. Well, she's not Mennonite. <laughs> but God has transformed her life in such significant ways. And that is a sign of the kingdom of heaven. I just love that. And then I also shared the story at the end of the Christian man in battle who met another Christian man. And he sat down and read the Bible with him and they had a great time and then he shot him. Because he, and he said, we'll meet you on the other side. Such a different concept of what the gospel is, the kingdom is. So tonight, um, I'm going to talk, Just I, I really don't, sometimes I feel unorganized, but I have a lot of things going on and a lot of questions. Uh, there's, there's a few questions that I would like to consider tonight. I remember earlier on, I mentioned how that these two paradigms, um, some of the very most basic questions in different ways. And I think we've seen that already. Maybe some of this is just repetition. But uh, I'm going to start with this question. Um, what, what is the gospel? What does that actually mean? So we're talking about the gospel, the kingdom of the gospel, salvation. But let's look now. What, what does that word actually mean? Uh, what, what's, somebody tell me. Do you, do you know what the word gospel, um, the definition Say it again. Good news, okay. Anyone else have an idea? It's close, I mean, it's connected to that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's very connected to the good news. It's announcing good news. Uh, it, the, 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 the root word is, it's kind of like evangel, or it's, it's connected to evangelism. And so an evangelist is a person who is announcing, who's sharing the good news. That's what it basically means to evangelize. Um, so it is the good news. And, and then as we share that good news, we become evangelists. Uh, so the gospel is basically the good news. Uh, and is the good news of the kingdom. That's what Jesus talked about. He, he talked about the good news of the kingdom. Um, and as we've been, yeah, so it's the good news. What is the gospel? It's the good news. Now, uh, what is the what is the mainstream perception of the gospel? Mainstream Christian, maybe. What's the what are other ways to think of this? Foolishness. Foolishness. Okay. Mm hmm. So it is foolishness to the world, that's right. Mm -hmm. What about to other Christians? Uh, maybe those, what is the gospel? I, I'm not even sure how to put this into words, but what, in, in evangelical Christianity, the gospel still means the same thing. I mean, in, in, you know, if you look at the root word or whatever, but what is the gospel? Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. So um, I, I think a lot of Jesus' teaching was the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, we need to repent because this is the case. And, and Jesus is king. And this is exciting news. And then Jesus dies and he rises again from the dead, the resurrection. I think we need to talk more about the resurrection. Because that's where the life comes from. I mean, the, the death of Jesus is, so, is, is important because there is... It's that, 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 in a sense, that's the payment for, for sin. But the resurrection is what gives us the life. It's, it's because of the resurrection that we can live. But the, so I think in a lot of mainstream thought, uh, the good news has more to do with avoiding hell than the good news of the kingdom coming, of a new, a new beginning, a new something, a resurrection, life. So, um, the next question I have, and I hope I can tie all of this together if we get that far. Um, and I'd, I'd like to hear from you. What, what would you say, now this isn't just the New Testament or Jesus teaching. Uh, let's, let's think bigger than this. What is the main theme of the Bible from your 
perspective. Well, what's the main theme of the Bible? Forgiveness. Say it again. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Okay. Restoration. Forgiveness. Restoration. Redemption. Okay. I'm not a very good speller, so if I spell something wrong, don't don't. Uh, forgiveness. Restoration. Someone said. What was another one though? Someone else said something. Redemption. Redemption. Okay. Uh, obedience. Okay, now this, this seems to sound fairly New Testament-ish. <laughs> is, is the Old Testament the same? Yeah. Okay. So it's redemption. God's redemption. Uh, okay, so any other thoughts? Christ is the center. Christ is the center. Mm -hmm. So the main theme is Christ. Good. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think we're the center of the story. Do you ever think about that? And I think this is where the gospel of salvation and this other gospel paradigm, it's about me getting saved so that I can get to heaven. And do you ever hear the, the thought that if, if I would have been the only person alive, Jesus would have come and died for me? I don't like that saying. I, maybe he would have, I don't know. But he didn't say that. <laughs> um, it, it, what, what that, I think what that, that idea uh, is saying is that it's really about me. Jesus came for me. And I think it's quite bigger than me. Oh, praise God. So Christ is the center. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, we're not the center. Jesus didn't come for you. You were a part of it, maybe, but he didn't come for you. He came for something bigger than you. And, I, and that's where I want to go with this. See, I, I think... Uh, when we put ourselves at the center of the story, we miss um, we miss a lot. So I'm going to suggest that okay, the main theme I think is God or Christ. You know, He's the center of the story, not you, not me. Uh, God is the center of the story. He is. Um, he's the main theme. He is the, and, and what he's doing in the world. But what he's doing in the world is, is uh, calling a people for himself. And I think we see that theme all the way through that God is, is redeeming a people. Like someone said, redemption. That is a theme all through the Bible. That God is redeeming and calling out a people for himself. That's his eternal purpose. He created man because he wanted a people, and we could go into that more. So I think uh, that sort of sums it up, that the main theme or the main part of the story is it's God, first of all, and then a people, uh, a people who live in peace and shalom and in the way that he is calling them to, that reflect him. Good. Um, <clears throat> the next question I'd like to ask is, what did Jesus come to do? And I, again, some of this is probably going to be repetitious, but that's okay. Sometimes we need repetition. What did Jesus come to do? Why did he come? To do the will of the Father. To do the will of the Father, okay. And I want you to think not just what we've been talking about, but what... What, does, what are some scriptures that talk about Jesus' purpose? What did he actually come for? So one is to do the will of the Father. Mm -hmm. Okay. He came to give us life. What else? What other scriptures can you think of? What did he come to do? Save the lost. Fulfill the law, good. Mm -hmm. What else? Save the world. Save? Mm -hmm. That's right. Where do we get that? Satan. Say it again. Satan. <laughs> Defeat Satan. There we go. Defeat Satan. Go ahead, John. What were you saying? Mm -hmm. John 3.16 talks about uh, in 17, it says he's not coming to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Mm -hmm. Any other scriptures or ideas that you can think about? 
Abundant life. What was in the back? Yeah, he came to show us the Father. He is the, the full expression of the Father. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's other things we could say. Uh, there's a scripture in John, uh, Luke 4, 43, it says, But he said unto them, I must preach the good tidings of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore was I sent. There's some, there's some places in the, in Jesus very specifically said, this is the reason I was sent. And there's not just one, but I think they, they, they do intertwine. Um, <clears throat> Matthew 9, 13 says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. Remember what repentance is? He came to call sinners to a new way of thinking, a new way, a new, a new, a new path. Um, John 3, 17 didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, and again, I'm going to mention that that word world is the cosmos. He came uh, that the world through him might be saved. And, and I think that, that, that scripture there uh, highlights that Jesus didn't just come for me. He came for the world. He came for something bigger than me and my uh, personal uh, security. <clears throat> He said, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Another place he said he came to set daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So that doesn't sound so nice. Uh, hopefully you don't take that as a reason not to get along with your mother-in-law. Um, Luke 19 says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I'd like to focus in on that word save. What does that mean anyway? So the, the next question I'd like to ask is, what is salvation? What do we think of when we think of salvation? Being saved. What, is Jesus, what does it mean? Jesus came to save us from our sins. It's very true. It's very clear. That was, one of, that was why he came. To save, us from the wrath of God. to save us from the wrath of God. Okay. What else are you thinking about that? Clear the record. Mm -hmm. Okay. Restore, redeem, good. And I think redemption has that idea of making making whole again, or 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 saving us, or or uh, buying us back. Mm -hmm. Good. What is it? We say it so easily. We talk about being saved. We all think we're saved. Uh, we all know we're saved, maybe. Um, but what is that anyway? What does it mean to be saved? Walk with God? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn to some scriptures here. Actually, I'll just, I'll just uh, read them, maybe. Uh, I think sometimes reading other scriptures that use the same word in different ways can help us understand the meaning or what, what may be a bigger meaning of what it is to see how it's used as we see how it's used in other places in the Gospels. So when the disciples were with Jesus on a stormy sea and thought they were about to die, they woke Jesus from his sleep and said, save us, Lord. It's the same word as is used to say that Jesus will save his people from their sins. He said, they said, save us, Lord, sozo us, Lord, we are perishing. In Matthew 9, 20 to 11, when a woman who was suffering from an issue of blood for 12 years came to Jesus uh, because she wanted to be healed and she wanted to touch the hem of his garment, <clears throat> we're told the inside story, what she was thinking uh, when she did this. And this is what she was thinking. She said, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. And it's the same word. I will get well. I will be sozoed. <laughs> um, she did, and she touched Jesus, and Jesus turned around, and, and she confessed what was going on, and Jesus said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. It's the same word. At once the woman was made sozo. And John three seventeen, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I just think it's interesting that in these instances, 
saving has a very practical, uh, it's saving in a very practical sense of the word. It's not just some mystical experience that happens in the heart. You know what I mean? Like, if, 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 uh, if they would have been saved and yet drowned, uh, we wouldn't have, that's not very, that's not what it's, you know, they weren't just saved in some uh, non-physical way. It was, it was a true, tra a, a real uh, saving. And so let's look at what the word means. So the word save means to save. <laughs> Sozo means to save, bring safely, to get well, to recover, to restore, to be made well. Now, I don't know if that makes much sense or if that catches your attention, but when I, if I think of salvation in that way, that's really neat. That is amazing. That Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Sometimes we think he came to save us in our sins. You know, we can be sinners and still be saved. Um, and we're still sinners saved by grace, right? We're going to always be sinners because that's just who we are. But Jesus came to save us from them. <laughs> now, I'm not saying we're going to be perfect human beings. We're still being saved. There's, there, there is an aspect where there's an initial experience of the new birth, where we are forgiven, where we're cleansed, where we're made, we're made whole in a sense, and we're made alive again. Um, and, and there's an, also a sense where that is ongoing, where God continues working on our lives, and sometimes we call that sanctification. But it's a real kind of substantial saving that Jesus does. He comes and actually makes us live again and turns us into a different kind of person, a new, a new man. We get well, we, we recover, we are restored, we are made whole. That's what Jesus came to do, to bring wholeness. And I bring us back to the word shalom. It means welfare, peace, completeness. Jesus, remember, is the prince of shalom. He will reign forever and ever. <clears throat> um, and Jesus came to bring peace. He is the prince of peace, completeness, safety, soundness. That, that idea of uh, much more than just peace in the heart or an experience inside. It's, it's a wholeness. It's a whole life transformation that I think we're talking about. So Jesus <clears throat> came to save. He came to make whole, to restore, to save, to really, 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 truly, actually save, <clears throat> to bring wholeness. In 2006, our, fa our family traveled to Europe and rented a motorhome in Germany. Um, and we traveled through the Netherlands, spent a weekend in Belgium, and went to France for a farm show. My brother had been living in Romania at the time, and he came over, and, and uh, we went to Switzerland and on to Italy. Uh, it was quite an interesting trip, very, very interesting. But one of the highlights of our trip was taking a tour of the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, according to Roman records, the, the Colosseum held 87,000 people. Uh, and, and, they could, and they told us when we were there, they could fill this place up in eight minutes. They would use whips to drive people into this Colosseum. I mean, when they were coming, and it was just a, it was, it was this frenzied, I don't know, something. Um, <clears throat> I remember standing in the Colosseum and hearing uh, the stories that they were telling of how thousands and thousands of people died right in that place, fighting animals and, and gladiator fights. According to one source I read, during 390 years, 400,000 people and a million animals died in that place. There were stories of Christians being, uh, meeting their punishment, uh, to wild animals, uh, meeting their end there. And I just, I just remember the, the sobering thought of think, just standing there and thinking about all the blood that was shed in that place. We have a story of a Christian monk named Telemachus, who around 404 was caught up in the crowds entering the Colosseum after the emperor had won an important battle. And he didn't realize what he was getting caught up in but to his horror, he witnessed the gladiators and the fight that was going on and realized people were, were going to die. And he ran down into the arena and he jumped in and he said, in the name of Jesus, stop. And he kept crying, in the name of Jesus, stop, until they killed him. And that was the last time. Uh, it was within a few hours that the emperor... Um, 
said that there will be no more of those in the Colosseum. No more of those war games. I think that is something of what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Jesus came to make things whole. Another example of the kingdom of heaven or Jesus' wholeness that he brings is, some of you probably know, Katora Stolzfus. She is from Bethel and uh, the daughter of John and Verna Stolzfus. She had been helping us with our twins when we were, when the twins came uh, sort of somewhat unexpectedly. And she's just a young, you know, spry, um, fun person, very nice lady to have around. When she quit working for us, her next job was to go to Peckway School and teach one handicapped boy. And I just had to stop and think, this is incredible. What kind of person would do that? What kind of person would give a year of their life just for a boy that might, might never contribute much to, to the world? I just think that is an incredible example of, of, of the transformation that Jesus brings in people's lives. It's it's the, the giving up of oneself. It's giving oneself for a cause that is bigger and, and dying and, and giving up a year for one child. Uh, I, I just think that is an amazing example of a restored world, a broken world, but also the restoration that God is bringing. So <clears throat> Jesus came to save are you saved? We should all say yes. <laughs> but we should all say probably that we're still being saved, right? I mean, there's still work that God is restoring us. So one man, when he was asked if he was saved, he said, ask my wife. Maybe she knows better. Um, or maybe your husband knows better. The people closest to us. How saved are we, really? How much more saved does Jesus want to get us or make us? Um, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'm going to leave us with those thoughts and let's just pray. Let's continue to pray that God's kingdom would come and his will would be done in our lives and our families. Tomorrow night I hope to consider more of the implications of Jesus' kingdom and how it could impact our lives um, in different ways. Thank you for your attention.